Welcome to the 3030 Health Podcast. The following discussion is for education and entertainment. It is not intended to diagnose or treat disease. Please do not apply any of this information without first discussing it with your doctor. Here is your host, Dr. Ruiz. Hello, everyone. Super excited for my guest today. My guest today is Dr. Micah Allen. She is a graduate of Bastyr University. She is a naturopathic doctor and licensed acupuncturist with additional training in Chinese herbal medicine. Prior to attending Bastyr, Dr. Allen attended Florida A&M University in Tallahassee. Dr. Allen specializes in reproductive, endocrine, and women's health. Dr. Allen's interest includes supporting families who are preparing to start a family by providing preconception, fertility, and post-birth care. She is a fellow of the American Board of Reproductive Oriental Medicine. Also, I am super excited to announce the Health Hacker Effect Summit, where experts who are in the business of optimizing your health, vibrancy, and well-being will give you advice that cannot be found from mainstream sources. This summit will be free from November 26th to December 2nd. I am one of the speakers in this summit, and I hope you join us. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the show. Hello, everyone. Super excited to be here with my friend, Dr. Micah Allen. Micah, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic today. Really excited about uh, starting this new month, getting clients you know, on board and helping them to obtain their optimal health goals. But I'm having a really fantastic day. Um, it's nice and sunny here in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, fall is kind of, you know, going back and forth. We're going between fall and what seems like a little, you know, hint of summer still hanging around, but but all is well on this end. So, you know, it, it's, I don't know if you can see my, there's a window, okay, and I'm in sunny Arizona. It's 70 degrees and raining. So it's this is like the weirdest day of the year, but <laughs> we're from Florida, and, uh, and and we're used to driving in the rain because it rains every damn day. In Arizona, you know, driving ability is uh, water-soluble, so it, if, <laughs> if, when it rains, forget about it. It's like the, the, the whole city stops. So I hinted that we're both from Florida. Mike and me went to the same high school and graduated the same year. How crazy is that? From this tiny little town in South Florida, Muck City, Belle Glade, Florida, we have two naturopaths that are practicing and uh, we're helping people. You know, I was looking actually for Glade Central High School football game scores. And uh, and I was like, you know, I wonder what, you know, my the people who graduated with me are doing. I stumbled upon an article and you were the valedictorian of my class. And Francia was number two. She was a salutatorian. You know, I was number six. Not that anyone's counting. Somewhere in there, Melissa Molina was there. Uh, anyways, and I'm, and, and I'm reading like uh, about like the top valedictorians from my year in Florida. And where are they now? And then I see your name and it says that she's a naturopath. And I'm, I got so freaking excited because I was like, <laughs> No way! There's two! But, okay, before we go on in true 3030 health fashion, Dr. Allen, what is your hero story? How did you end up in this health space? So the story of me ending up in, in the health space um, is one of, of interest. Um, I have an undergraduate degree in animal science pre-veterinary medicine. I started my matriculation in undergrad at Florida A&M University in Tallahassee, Florida. And while there, you know, I really enjoy my curriculum. Um, I thought for sure that I wanted to be and was dead set on being a veterinarian. And um, second year in, you know, I started to get this inkling, oh, maybe I want to work with humans, you know, so I'll, I'll go and hang out in the hospital and, and be a candy striper and see, you know, how I feel and how that resonates with me. It was a wonderful experience of being able to see clients, obviously very fast paced. And I got a longing and a love for patient care and patients of the human species. Um, <laughs> Different type of mammals. <laughs> yes, absolutely. The, the pace was, you know, very quick. Um, but I found myself wanting, con wanting to connect to 
um, the client story, that backstory of how they got there, um, you know, what they were doing to kind of manage their care outside of obviously this acute presentation that they were currently in. And so I started to explore a little bit more and kind of stumbled upon Bastyr University and found the perfect, um, what I would say, the perfect medicine um, for me and what I wanted to offer my clients and patients. Um, so after finishing up at Florida a and in about three and a half years, I ventured out to Seattle, Washington, where I started on my naturopathic medicine career. And from there, um, you know, had the opportunity to get exposure to acupuncture and Chinese medicine and saw how wonderful it was in addition to naturopathic medicine and decided that I wanted to add that to my toolbox as well. So um, a little bit of a go-getter, I said to myself that I, I wanted to grab as much knowledge as I could while I was at Bastyr because my intent was not to return. Uh, so I finished... Uh, with the Doctor of Naturopathic Medicine and Chinese Herbal Medicine um, degree, as well as acupuncture. Um, so it's been quite the journey. I, I would say, you know, my hero's journey, um, what I pull from and what really helped to, you know, kind of keep me going on a daily basis was um, a process that occurred while at Bastyr. While I was there about two years prior to my graduation, my husband and I were blessed with the ability to grow our family, right? So some folks are like, you know, medical school, growing a family. Um, you know, it was absolutely an adventure, but one I would not, uh, you know, I wouldn't necessarily um, say that I wouldn't do again. It was an amazing experience. It was a time where, you know, I was doing my best to maintain my health by hiking and eating nutritionally dense foods, which Obviously, being at Bastyr, the awesome cafeteria there helped with that piece. And then being under the care of an awesome naturopathic midwife um, just for day-to-day -day management. But, you know, let's be real. I was carrying 20-plus hours of coursework and clinical rotations. Sometimes my days would span 12 to 14 hours a day. At that point, you know, I was doing both the naturopathic medicine and acupuncture programs. But, you know, for the most part, I felt pretty healthy my blood pressure was normal. I was gaining the, you know, I would say a recommended amount of weight gain during pregnancy. My clinical markers were all within normal range. And my little fellow was growing remarkably well. So my husband and I, you know, couldn't wait to have him join our fold. And so I don't know if you remember or not, uh, but the summer of 2009 in Seattle was brutal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> temperatures were hitting the triple digits and I was still pounding the pavement, you know, with my daily activities. Um, I found myself needing to hydrate a little bit more often and just some small aching sensations in my lower back. But I was right at 36 weeks. Um, we had planned to do, you know, an ultrasound just to check the positioning of the baby. And so we decided to move forward with that um, after a full day of clinical rotation. So during that routine ultrasound check, my, my son was found to be in a frank breach position. You know, for those of you who don't have uh, medical degrees, frank breach basically means that his bottom was at the bottom of the cervix and his legs um, were basically up towards his head. So he was flipped in the opposite direction of what he should be for birth. Um, so because I had access to all these amazing practitioners, I called to schedule acupuncture and moxa treatments to kind of help turn the baby into a favorable position. And so we'll just fast forward from five that, you know, that evening when I had the ultrasound up to eight o'clock that night and my husband and I are just kind of enjoying dinner and watching a movie when I hear a loud pop. Hmm. Yep. My water broke right at 36 weeks, 36 weeks. Whoa. With a Frank breach presenting babe. Um, and since my, my pregnancy had been normal up until that time, we had planned to give birth at this amazing freestanding birthing center in the city. But obviously those plans changed dramatically. And so my husband and I reached out to our midwife while I showered and then readied myself to head to the hospital. And so my midwife recommended a hospital and doctor that was most knowledgeable about delivering Frank Breach presenting babes as of course, now is considered a lost art in conventional medicine because 
most of the OBs aren't trained to vaginally deliver breech babies. It's going to be a C-section. Yep. So with my midwife in tow, now acting as my doula, we head over and basically are scheduled for, um, you know, an emergency C-section. Um, my son, thankfully, was delivered healthy and went on to have a night of kangaroo care with my husband while I supplied the colostrum and, re- you know, kind of recovered from major surgery. Um, thankfully, he was able to regulate his blood sugar and um, temperature levels within the 12 hours after birth. And then we started our lifelong connection outside of the womb soon thereafter. And so I would say that this is kind of my hero story or my hero journey because this experience, you know, not only changed me because I had this idea of what a picture perfect birth um, would look like, you know, and then I had to experience something that was completely different from what I had imagined, although it was still a wonderful process. So it taught me grace. Um, flexibility and resiliency. So four years later, I had the joy of experiencing pregnancy and childbirth again, this time with my daughter, who was born after 41 weeks of gestation (laughs) as a vaginal birth after cesarean section. Oh, so that's that's awesome, you know, and in that you know encapsulates so many things that we see within uh, within our medicine, you know. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, Charles Poliquin. He's huge in within you know the CrossFit and uh, weightlifting community, but um, and uh, he passed away on the 25th. And this dude, you know, he was healthy you know uh, and people look up to him and but things happen we're never prepared to uh we we can never prepare enough for all these unexpected things and and thank god for uh for modern medicine it it's amazing the things that we can do uh under under the the scalpel and then it's even better what we can do as naturopaths to help you recover from Absolutely. that scalpel, and and that's amazing. So, so Micah, can you, for my listeners, you know, who might not know where we're from, can you describe what Belglade floor is like, and how unlikely it is to have two naturopaths come from Glade Central High School from the same class? <laughs> I will have to set the record straight, Doctor Ruiz, because. I know that the listeners may be listening um, from the hometown. And so I'm originally from South Bay, Florida. Oh, man. (laughs) So you're from (laughs) South Bay. I want to make sure that I get that right. Well, you know, you know what's funny? My girlfriend's from Clewiston. So, so man, there's going to be some, there's going to be some uh, bad blood in this. Uh, You know, all these people listening, they're going to be like, oh, man. So South Bay, about one traffic light away from Belgrade. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So Muck City or the Tri-City area um, that that basically is composed of Bell Glade, South Bay, and Pahokee, there are a lot of agriculture farming that occurs in in that area. It's based at the southernmost tip of Lake Okeechobee, and the motto is, her soil is her fortune. And I like to really think about not only the soil being her fortune, but the people the people of the Glaze area are uh, phenomenal people. Um, Dr. Ruiz and myself are amongst those people, but um, really strong drive for uh, accomplishing, a strong drive for community, uh, making sure that you know we are our brothers and sisters keepers is what I would take away from the South Bay area. It tends to be economically disadvantaged um, but again, there is so much knowledge, um, so much empowerment and community in that area um, that I'm, I'm really excited to see all of the future endeavors that come from folks who have gone off and, and, and allowed themselves to gain knowledge, experience, and bring those things back to the Glades area to help motivate and, and get her people up to the potential that I know, and I'm sure Dr. Ruiz knows, is there. So really excited to be from the area. It's a predominantly uh, uh, people of color community, too. You know, it's like heavy, heavy uh, in diversity. And, you right. know, so I was born in Brownsville, Texas, grew up in, uh, in Mexico. I, I lived in Mexico for 14 years. 
and then um, moved to Brownsville for freshman year in high school. And I walk into the high school, base high school, it's 90% Latino. <laughs> so I was a Latino kid going to a Latino high school uh, in probably 8% Caucasian and probably 2% everything else, you know. Uh, and then uh, I moved to Belclay, Florida, and I walk into Glade Central High School as a sophomore. What was it? 80% African-American probably? Yeah. And all of a sudden... I'm a minority, you know, so growing in Brownsville, you know, sh sure, I'm a minority, but I never understood what being a minority was because everyone looked like me. <laughs> uh, and, right. and, and I was intrinsically part of that culture. So then I, I go to, uh, to Glade Central and all of a sudden I finally realized the struggle of being a minority in the United States of America to a different level because not only was I a, a minority at, at, at Glade Central, I, I was a minority within a minority and I learned so much about everything, you know, about life, just going through Glade Central High School. And like, like Dr. Allen said, you know, the soul is our fortune, and within that, you know, uh, it just so happens that Bell Glade and South Bay and Pahokee and Cluiston, <laughs> uh, they, the soil is primed to grow produce, and, and it's like this very special soil. We call it muck. It's dark, and it's full of nutrients, and uh, it's being used mostly to grow sugarcane. So, so it, you know, like how many layers of intricacy, you know, so you have uh, minorities uh, and then you have a lot of, you know, it's not a very well-to-do area and they're growing sugar for people to consume, to make it as cheap as possible so we can eat processed foods. It is so complicated because anytime I come on this mic and I start talking about the importance of eliminating sugar... In the back of my head, I know that I have family members that depend on sugar for them to make their paychecks. It sometimes fucks with my head because th this community survives because of, because of sugar. And then within all of this, you know, Glade Central has one of the highest numbers of graduates that made it to the NFL. So much culture, uh, so much tradition. And then, you know, so many cool people have come out of Bell Glade, Florida. San Antonio Holmes, he's a, a, a Glade Central graduate. Fred Taylor, Glade Central High School uh, uh, graduate. Anquan Bolden, he's Pahokee graduate. You know, so it, it's insane. And then within all of that, then we have two doctors that went uh, that graduated from the same class, and we ended up in this naturopathic medical community. Now, I assume and I hope that a lot of people from Bell Glade, Florida, will probably tune in to this podcast because why not? <laughs> For people, you know, from maybe our classmates, you know, that I, you know, I, I, I don't have a really poor job at, con at keeping connected with our classmates. I only talk to like Carrie Medina and Gloria, and, and that's about, you know, Nuria sometimes. But for, for our classmates that might listen to this because it's so weird, what's naturopathic medicine? Naturopathic medicine is a type of medicine that I hold really dearly to my heart, um, mainly because we even look back at the six principles of naturopathic medicine. Um, so we, we look into prevention, um, first do no harm, empowerment or teaching, um, finding the cause, holism, and finally the healing power of nature. Um, I think those six principles do a fantastic job of explaining and, and being a great example of what naturopathic medicine embodies. It's a type of medicine that I feel like it meets my clients and my patients exactly where they are and helps them to journey to where they want to be. Um, it's the type of medicine that is gentle. It's approachable. Um, it's a medicine that is digestible by its, uh, you know, by its clients and consumers. Um, one that is patient. Um, it's just it's an amazing art form. 
it's art, um, and and it also just happens to be medicine as well. well you know, it, it's funny that you mentioned uh, our medicine being digestible, and that you know I've never used that, and I think I'm gonna steal it from you, and I'm gonna start using it <laughs> because <laughs> because that is exactly it. You know, how many times have you heard of a patient that went to the doctor, and the doctor said eat healthy, and that's it. What does that mean? What does a person from a tiny little South Florida town that uh, is sustained by sugar cane, how, how is that is that mentality going to process eat healthy versus someone that is from Oregon or from Seattle that has been around uh, different uh, you know uh, uh, markets and and you know co-ops and all of that. And, and, and you give that same information to someone from the Northwest and they're going to process that completely different because there is only one superstore or, or uh, one grocery store in, in, uh, in Belglade and how many fast food chains do we have there? Right. You know, there are a couple of like Mexican markets that have fresh produce and, you know, but there is that, you know, that that could be, you know, as close as a food desert, you know, without being one as it can get. And you're talking about a place where her soil is her fortune, that muck is prime to grow vegetables and to grow all of these beautiful things. And yet we're using it to grow sugarcane. How do you explain to someone what eat healthy means. Right. So absolutely. The principle of empowerment and teaching, which is, again, one that I hold dearly. We'll talk a little bit more about it later. But that means that, you know, instead of just telling someone eat healthy, you have to break down what eating healthy looks like for them. For each particular person, it's going to be different because each person presents differently. Each person has a, a different subset of genetic predispositions. Each person has a different set of environmental exposures, okay? And so the, the really neat thing about naturopathic medicine, and when we look at folks who have not necessarily had exposure to it, is that I see people get excited about what they can do and how they can change the outcome of not only their health, but then when we look at the studies of epigenetics, how they can transform the health of their future generations, and so we're not only talking about, you know, whether or not, you know, if you're a diabetic, if you need to decrease the amount of animal protein that you're intaking on a daily basis and increase the amount of complex carbohydrates, make sure you're getting some omega-3 fatty acids and how that's going to impact their hemoglobin A1C. But let's talk about how this is going to shift and change the trajectory of the health of your future generations. What is that going to look like for them? And so it's about empowering. It's about educating. It's about showing a different outcome that they may not have ever thought existed for them. So we can look prospectively and, and talk about like, you know, if uh, let's say your A1C is trending uh, higher and you, you know, and while you're doing prenatal care and that this is what can happen to your baby if, if you continue trending that way and explain to them, you know, how uh, changing those parameters is going to help the future generation. But we can also look retrospectively and learn from our ancestors and mm -hmm. learn from culture and from your own personal, uh, you know, background and teach people to eat like their grandparents. <laughs> and, and that is so cool. That was one of the biggest aha moments in my life, you know, when I realized that I was trying to, with the help of technology, eat this Frankenstein-looking diet. And, <laughs> and when I was living in Mexico, I was basically eating grass-fed beef uh, and, uh, you know, organic vegetables that, you know, we would get every, every day, before, you know, they were fresh. And my mom would cook with very little processed foods. Those processed foods were like a luxury. So then we move to the United States, we get a little bit of coin, so now we're eating processed foods every day. And I was like, whoa, did I get it wrong? And th that started this process of like education and reading blogs and, and uh, listening to podcasts. And, and then the realization that I have the power 
as a physician to change people's lives. And using this, this methods and using this, you know, empowerment and this easily digestible medicine to help them. <laughs> So, so cool. You know, we can talk about, about nutrition. Is that it? Is, so are we just nutritionists? No, not nutritionists at all. I, I would describe myself as a clinician that has been trained in both Eastern and Western medical approaches. You know, our, our curriculum, you know, we have pharmacology, we have anatomy and physiology, embryology. I mean, we, we get the, the total package. Um, but in addition to that, we are also trained in nutrition, botanical medicine, physical medicine. I mean, I again, when I look back and think about the curriculum that we've gone through, um, you know, the naturopathic approach, but then bringing on the Eastern medicine, um, you know, the the ancient Chinese medical practices, it's just an amazing array of toolbox and opportunities to be able to impact people at different stages of their life. So, um, no, we're not just nutritionists. Uh, we also understand labs, imaging. And so a lot of my clients, they will come in with this idea that, you know, I've tried and done everything. How can you help me? How can we move past this point um, where I feel like it's a point of no return? And so the ability to look at labs, assess, you know, labs that may be on, you know, just outside of the lower end of normal or just outside of the upper limits of normal um, and be able to predict whether or not, you know, certain disease processes will take effect and, and work on preventing those by implementing lifestyle modifications or repleting nutrients that may be deficient in some, in some places. So, it's so important to make that distinction, you know, that that we are not just, uh, you know, treating people with diet. We're not just treating people with acupuncture needles. We're not just treating people with supplements. We're not just treating people with herbals. We're not just treating people with medication. We uh, we can do all of those things. And, and uh, I remember when I was working at the emergency department, uh, and, and just from the experience that I've personally had with the medical system and from the experience that my family has had with the medical system and those five-minute visits where you just walk in and then they write a prescription. And if there's no prescription for a certain ailment, then you're SOL. Right. And and it's not, you know, it, it not not to, you know, uh stomp on our on our medical doctor, you know, uh friends. It's not their fault. It's the system's fault. You know, uh insurance models have made this very murky, crazy system where you only get 5 minutes and you have to follow a certain rubric and you have to order certain labs for certain things. When you have this system where you are in a pressure cooker where, where you only have five minutes in order to treat a patient and you have a prescription pad in front of you and you want to help that patient, you know, the saying is if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. With our medicine, not only do I spend more than five minutes with that patient, I get to talk to them about their uh, their medical history. You know, uh, my first intake is around an hour <laughs> and I get to ask you about your poops and I get to ask you about, you know, how do you sleep? How, what's your diet? And if I see that I can fix something with the basics, I don't have to grab a prescription pad because I have so many different tools. I could grab maybe an awesome tincture. I could give you a supplement. I could recommend a change in dietary lifestyle. I could do all of it while you are getting into that point where you're not going to need any medication, any supplement, and uh, you're just sustaining yourself with a good diet. Or I could write you a prescription if, if you need it, you know, like if someone has high blood pressure, I can recommend to you to eat a healthy diet. But if you're going to stroke out on me, I'm not going, I'm not doing my due diligence. So in, in some cases, it is necessary to write a prescription, understanding that it's just a Band-Aid. And eventually, we will need to change lifestyle. And we can do all of that because our medicine is awesome. We have so many tools that we can use. Now, 
when I was at SCNM, and, and SCNM and Bastyr are probably as vicious of rivals as <laughs> South Bay and Belkley, <laughs> or, 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 or Pahokee High and Glade Central High School during uh, the Muck Bowl. You know, we're fierce rivals, guys. Uh, when I was at, at, at SCNM and uh, I came to this profession, you know, through listening to blogs and whatever, and Chris Kresser was a big influence in my life, and he's an acupuncturist. So I was like, dude, I'm going to be like the Chinese medicine dude. I'm, it's going to be awesome. I'm, and I started <laughs> taking classes and I was like, nope. <laughs> it didn't, you know, like the, that first class, it was, it, it was not, you know, like the introduction class. I was like, this makes no sense. I don't understand what's going on. And then as, as it progressed and I, I, you know, started learning the points and starting, you know, actually practicing in clinic, I kind of like, oh, man, I, I kind of like uh, traditional Chinese medicine. Now, you love traditional, uh, traditional Chinese medicine. Yes, can you, can you Can you tell us a little bit about what it is? Yeah, so traditional Chinese medicine is a medicine that's rooted in thousands of years of practice originating from China. Um, it's a combination of uh, acupuncture, which uses uh, sterilized needles, uh, along 12 main meridians um, to help with decreasing pain, shifting um, disease processes by way of managing and adjusting the nervous system. We also have traditional Chinese medicine herbs. So more than 300 different herbs in the Materia Medica of Chinese medicine um, that work and can be used as single um, herbs, or we can use them in combinations, mainly again to help support a client um, during their, you know, look for optimal health and managing disease processes. Um, we also use Chinese medicine, um, or not only use Chinese medicine for what most people think about is in regards to pain management, but I have clients who are um, seeking fertility support, preconception care. Uh, clients who need help with modulating their hormones, um, clients who are experiencing cardiovascular disease. And so just as we spoke about naturopathic medicine, being able to help clients with an array of different disease processes, traditional Chinese medicine can be a great um, supportive um, medicine, although it is its own system within itself, uh, to help clients again, to achieve those optimal health goals. And, and you know, uh, there's a big misconception that, you know, that TCM is just needles. That's such a huge misconception, you know, because anytime you, you get a true traditional Chinese medicine treatment, you're going to address diet. You're going to address, you know, deficiencies or excesses. So, like, are you drinking too much? <laughs> uh, are you not sleeping enough? You know, you, you might use needles, but n needles is a fraction, you know, it, it, you know, but it's like the thing that we remember uh, about traditional Chinese medicine, you know, the acupuncture because, you know, or, or, or some of copying, you know, with like people like Michael Phelps, you know, uh, going on the Olympics and having those uh, copying marks. But it's just a fraction. There is so much more, like you said, it, it, its own system in, and, and, I do a little bit of acupuncture, mostly for my pain patients, you know, or for someone with like uh, uh, with nausea or you know some some acute symptom. I you know I might throw some needles at someone uh, that comes to my. I'm by no means go see Dr. Allen. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not the the most well versed in, in in acupuncture, but it is amazing that you know that we can learn uh, that within our education to help people. Now, I practice in Scottsdale, Arizona. I have uh, one of the widest scopes of, of practice in, in the nation. You know, it's, it's pretty cool. I get to do a bunch of things. You are in an unlicensed state. And I, you know, I want to thank you for that because the more practitioners are practicing in unlicensed states, the better the chances of our medicine, you know, becoming more prominent and, and being available everywhere. Florida, where we're from, is an unlicensed state. Can you explain to us what the difference between an unlicensed state and a licensed state is? That's a, a great question. Um, and I had an opportunity to do some lobbying work in Florida while I was in school. 
And so I'm still holding out, and I'm sure you are as well, yeah. for one day we can have some, um, you know, some active licensure occurring um, in the state of Florida. But the huge difference, as Dr. Rue has stated, um, you know, actually right out of graduation, I practiced in Seattle um, close to five years um, in, I would say, maybe the second broadest scope of practice, second or third to Oregon um, in Washington state. So the ability to prescribe um, certain medications um, that are put in place by the Board of Medicine in those states is allowed. Um, there's also the ability to do physical exams um, as a practitioner. Um, there's the ability to, you know, if you wanted to, to, to draw labs out of your office, right? So do blood draws, do um, intramuscular or IV injections or infusions. The scope or the ability to function as a primary care physician in those states is one that can be considered um, accessibility, obviously, to the public is more broad and more um, available for clients who are in states that are licensed. While in an unlicensed state, as a naturopathic doctor only, my ability to do a physical exam does not exist. My ability to diagnose does not exist. But you can diagnose um, under your acupuncture license. Right. And so my acupuncture license allows me a lot more flexibility and ability to, again, do that physical exam, allow patients or recommend um, patients. I do a lot of partnering with um, physicians who are in the Richmond area on, hey, I'm seeing this again because we talked about being able to sit with patients for that hour, hour and a half. I may pick up on something that their primary care didn't see because, again, of those five to 10 minute uh, sporadic visits that they are seeing uh, their clients. And so I have a lot of practitioners that I partner with and say, hey, maybe we can, you know, instead of just drawing a TSH for this patient, um, maybe, you know, consider adding on a T3 and a T4 and some antibodies just to assess whether or not there might be a little bit more going on with them because they're presenting with signs and symptoms, although this one particular lab may not necessarily show you know, progression of this disease process. And so, yeah, being in an unlicensed state, the biggest issue, I think, for consumers is that because there is no licensing board, the ability for someone to call themselves a naturopath in an unlicensed is state, yeah. present in an unlicensed state. So for the consumer, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you legislators um, in, in all of these states that are unlicensed, it becomes an issue because anyone can call themselves a naturopath and a consumer would go into um, that into that business um, and think that they're interfacing with someone who's had clinical experience, who've had the ability to go through a rigorous curriculum, who's had the experience of knowing what, you know, a lab that's outside of a normal range and needs referral to another provider looks like. And so I would challenge um, legislators, I would challenge consumers uh, for states that are unlicensed to, you know, let's get on our good foot, let's get um, naturopathic medicine licensed in all 50 states and, and just make sure that consumers are able to access this medicine in the way, um, you know, that it, it should be. Um, that they should be interfacing with this medicine. So that would be my description of the two. Well, and, and, and just to, you know, just to uh, add to what you just said, you know, naturopath is not an adjective. It's, it's a license that, that you have to earn through a lot of hard work. Uh, and you have to go through the school and you have to take boards and you have to do all of these things. We are looking at a shortage of general practitioners and especially in underserved populations. What if Florida all of a sudden licensed naturopathic uh, physicians and you could, you could become a, a doctor of naturopathic medicine and then you can set up shop somewhere in, in the muck area and now you have general practitioners serving those underrepresented and underserved 
populations. I want to do preventive medicine. Most of the care that I do is sick care. It's people that have been going from one doctor to another doctor to another doctor, and they finally get here, and then, you know, we help them. I want to practice preventive medicine. That's why I came to this profession. It's not until I get someone super healthy that I can start talking about preventive medicine. Okay, let's make sure we do a cardiac score to prevent cardiac disease in the future. Let's make sure you're, uh, you know, we, we're we ordering, you know, a color guard so we don't have to do a colonoscopy. And if, if that is positive, then we, we're going to have to help you go through a colonoscopy and then we're going to help you fight the bad effects of a colonoscopy. But I can't get to that point where I'm actually doing preventive medicine up until people are healthy. And people complain about the cost of health insurance. People complain about Obamacare. Well, if we had more general practitioners that are willing to spend more than five minutes to learn what's going on with their patient, those rising healthcare costs would go down. Exactly. And especially if we can take insurance companies out of the equation and we can do this as a cash-based system where people are actually paying for the health care that they are receiving. And I think that if we had that model across the United States, I'm not saying to eradicate all MDs and I'm not saying to eradicate specialties. What I'm saying is that there is a need for general practitioners And there are general practitioners all over the country, like Dr. Micah Allen, who are practicing uh, uh, on on, on an unlicensed state because she wants to help people and she knows the power of her medicine. So she's breaking, she's trailblazing in order to help people in her community get healthier. So write to your representatives, tell them about this problem and help us get all 50 licensed. The other piece there, too, you know, like you said, I think naturopathic medical practitioners, we, we're all innovators, right? We have so many different capacities that we can impact um, the health of not only our clients that we see on a one-on-one basis, but community. Um, and so my private practice is Essential Natural Health. It's and based in Richmond, Virginia. Um, 75% of the time, I'm seeing on-site clients at the clinic, but I would say, you know, the remainder of the time I'm participating in some form of supporting academia. Um, and so I'm, I'm out. I am interfacing with university students, with students who are interested in being, you know, nurse practitioners, medical doctors, um, radiologists. And I'm talking about the science, obviously. We're definitely staying on board as far as the curriculum is concerned. But I'm also infusing those naturopathic principles. I let it, I'm letting them know, hey, there are complementary therapies that are available to clients to help them be able to transform the way that their life looks like or what they might have an idea of what their life would look like with these certain disease processes occurring. And so for a large subset of the students that I have, a lot of them have never heard of naturopathic medicine. Some of them may have heard of acupuncture because of a movie. Um, But the other, you know, the other systems, when we get talking to or think about Ayurvedic medicine, when we look into Tibetan medicine, we look at yoga, um, we look at the study of prana, those things are completely foreign to some of those, some of those students. And so I have anatomy and physiology students. I have students that I'm teaching at a university level, the introduction of complementary and alternative medicine. And so instead of me just talking about it, I bring people in. I can talk about naturopathic medicine. I can talk about the acupuncture. But if we have yoga practitioners local, I'm saying, hey, you come in. I have one student who's tried yoga. The rest of the class has never tried yoga. I'm going to do a lecture on yoga, but I want you to come in for an hour and a half. We're going to do a half hour meditation. They're going to do a half hour of yoga, and then we'll talk about their experience and what it was like. So not only for my students, but for my clients, I think a lot of times it's about just jumping out there and trying it, giving it a go to see how you respond. And a lot of times when we put ourselves into um, those um, opportunities, although they may be foreign or different, a lot of times we find that there are things that we can take away that can be beneficial for us. And so, yeah, Essential Natural Health is a private practice. 
you know, Dr. Ruiz was talking about the glades and, and how, you know, we can be impactful, although not necessarily having license in the state. Um, a year and a half ago, myself and my husband were talking about a nonprofit. So we now have Essential Natural Wellness, which is a nonprofit organization. And I've done a few um, summer intensives in South Bay, Belle Glade. Uh, we've done lectures. Um, but the idea, again, is to get this valuable information out to the community to be able to impact the lesser of those um, folks who don't have access, who may not have access if we aren't going out in droves to give it to them. So I'm really excited to to have the opportunity to be a guide, but also to be a light to people um, who are looking for a different way of, of being and a different way of interfacing with medicine. And, you know, in that different way, I hate the term alternative medicine because yeah. because what we're offering is not an alternative to medicine. What we're right. offering is evidence-based medicine that is helping so many people across those licensed states and so many people all across the world with like naturopaths without borders and, and uh, missions and things like that. So this is not quackery this is not this is evidence-based medicine that is primed to help this under uh serve communities so dr allen you know what a great conversation um where can people find you how can people uh, how can people in richmond virginia come and see you so i have a website the website is simply drmicaallen.com so d-r-m-i-c-a-h-a-l-l-e-n.com And so the ability to make um, or schedule appointments online is available there. Uh, you can also reach out to our lovely support staff and they can get you scheduled as well. Um, there is also the ability to book telemedicine visits as well. So again, that can be done online or by calling the office number. What about like, uh, any social media? Any, any, uh, how can people keep up with you on the daily? Yes, yeah, social media. Um, obviously, if we're going to be impactful um, to our surrounding communities, I think it's really important to get social, quote unquote. So on Instagram, you guys can find me at Green Mama Doc. And then on Facebook, the Facebook business page is Essential Natural Health. And then there's also a Facebook page for the nonprofit, which is uh, simply Essential Natural Wellness. Awesome. Awesome. You know, thank you so much for coming on the show. I totally just like email her and uh, I think I actually did a uh, Facebook uh, cold. I was like, Hey, <laughs> we're both nature pets. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, let me know how can I, uh, how, how I can help you and anything you need. And let's have you back on the show in like, you know, six months and see, see how we're doing. Or next time you were, uh, you're going to the muck, let me know. And maybe I can make an appearance too. Absolutely. It sounds great. Thank you again so much for inviting me. I'm really um, happy to have shared this time and space with you and with your audience. So um, be well, and I look forward to catching up again soon. Awesome. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon.